It's been a long time since I've done any of this. You know, much less be the one. Hi, I'm Kent Adams, and you've been missing me for a while, and there's a good reason for it. And let me explain some of that. Uh, the last nine months have been a very difficult time. We were w working at Spokane Talks into a really fantastic year with political and with more advertising and everything else. And then on May 1st, which you may recall was Bloomsday, my wife passed away. That was one very negative thing, as you can imagine, when you've been married for almost 55 years. And we've had four children. Uh, and then, 10 days later, I was coming down the hill. I stopped in time for some car coming out of a driveway, but two cars behind me did not. And they ran into me and I had a rear ender that essentially totaled my car. Not right away, but totaled the car. The insurance company wouldn't do, do it. And I thought, well, okay, those are two things. Um, my eyesight isn't the best it could be. It's time to go in and have my eyes checked. I uh, haven't done that for the last couple of years because, you know, with COVID and everything, they say, you know, don't get close to doctors and nurses and everything. And so I waited and I went in and was told that, well, you probably need cataract surgery. So I did that. That's a process, a uh, very easy process, matter of fact. It was a pleasant process, great people who did it. Um, you do it, you wait a few weeks, you do it, then you wait another two weeks after you've done one eye because you can't cover both eyes and survive. I go through that and then I get my new glasses. The world is gonna be so much better, I can see much better now, except that the glasses didn't solve the problem. What the problem ended up being is the one thing that the eye specialists have had said all along is, at least you don't have wet macular degeneration, which is incurable, but can be slowed down, I have found out. And that's what I have. And so between all of that and some balance problems and some other kinds of things, the last nine months have been very difficult. Um, selling our house of 39 years on the South Hill, bought a, a double-wide uh, 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 manufactured home in a beautiful little community, and my, my oldest son lives with me. He's Down syndrome. Uh, and I say that only because I go back 53 years almost now when he was born. And, and in those days, the options were what institution would you like to put him in? We, were, we lived in Los Angeles, so there are a lot, lots of choices. My wife and I made the choice one day, I can tell you exactly where I was that day, that no, he's our son, we're gonna bring him home. Little did I figure 50 some years later, I would be the one left with my son, Bradley. He's doing quite well. He stays a couple of days a week with my oldest daughter and the rest of the week with me and loves, loves it and is thriving and is involved in bowling and a number of activities. And so um, I've been asked recently by a lot of people, what are you up to? We don't see you. What's happened to Spokane Talks uh, and so forth? I started Spokane Talks about six years ago. And one of the people that were deeply involved with the program and became my news director was Sulani Madsen, who I met, I'm gonna say 15 years ago when she was our choice for uh, the project manager for Mirabu Point. I was one of about eight volunteers who did that $30 million project out in the valley. Very proud of that. Uh, people, I, I was a consultant at the time, so, Every hour I would spend on that was free time, of course, and not billable hours for my consulting time. And I remember people asking me, well, why are you doing that? You're giving up a lot of money, you know, to, to be doing it. And my answer always was, it's for my grandchildren. Aren't there things that we all do for our grandchildren? And then about 12 years, 10 years ago, 
my daughter sent me a picture of my grandson, my oldest grandson, uh, playing football out there. And so now I have a picture I can prove that it was for my grandson. But we all know we do things for the community. I'm very proud of that. In fact, in fact, I'm very proud of him because he's second year at Gonzaga University and is one of the men's basketball managers. So uh, he's gone from pre-law to, uh, to a, uh, sports management. And being at Gonzaga University is a good place to go to get all that. I mentioned Sulani because Sulani has been a friend, a mentor, a consultant, uh, the designer of, of uh, Mirabu Point out there, all the things that we wanted to have there are there because of Sulani and her, her uh, tenacity to get things done. And so I've asked Sulani to join me today to ask some questions and kind of set the stage because nobody wants to hear just from me. So Sulani, it's yours. So Kent, thank you for inviting me to join you for this um, uh, great farewell tour, I suppose, in a way. But at first, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, your background that you brought to Spokane Talks. You had a lot of experience in television and uh, radio and broadcast, and you took that to Washington Water Power, later Avista, training people to tell their stories. Yeah. And that's what you wanted to do with Spokane Talks. So let have a little bit of, uh, share a little bit about the background of Spokane Talks Online was the first name, and then Spokane Talks Media. Well, when at, when at what is now Avista, it was then Water Power 30 years ago when I was there, I had, I was community relations. I was out in the community. I was not on TV or radio very much at that time. But my job, honestly, was to train of all people and engineers and, and uh, 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 accountants will understand. A utility company is made up of mainly engineers and accountants and to explain to them and train them on how to deal with the media. Not to talk in such technical terms that not only the reporter but the people at home watching the, the news segment will understand and how to say it in those days in 12 and 15 and 18 second sound bites. Today sound bites are much shorter because people's attention span is much shorter. But I enjoyed that and uh, I also started a program that many people are aware of called Project Share where it helps people with uh, uh, when they ha need help with their utility bills whether it's with uh, 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 water power or a Vista or one of the other companies in town to help people because we know people you know with cold winters like we've had it, it becomes very difficult to pay sometimes uh, the rates and so forth and I'm very proud of that program that's raised millions of free dollars from the public to help people and, 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 uh, and help, uh, help them pay their utility bills. So Kent, when you retired from that, a, a very fulfilling career, I, I, I'm one of the people that joked with you that you flunked retirement. Yes, I did. So when you flunked retirement or when Pat told you you needed to get a, a hobby, you started yeah. Spokane Talks Online. T yeah. Tell us a little bit about the, the first, the early days of Spokane Talks Online. Yeah. Well, the, and, the, and that's what we called it because we were moving from what, it, what was six, seven years ago now would be the, the traditional TV that we watch when we watch uh, KXLY or NBC or whatever it might be. You go to Channel 6, Channel 2, Channel 4. But we were going to be on the internet and that was something new. I knew enough from selling at both KHQ and Fox 28, including producing some programs uh, called House to Home up there at Fox 28 and how to repair your homes and, and things like that. And um, I, I, I knew enough to be dangerous probably is the way to say it. Um, but what I didn't know was much about the new medium, meaning the internet and uh, uh, all of that. And so I tried to replicate traditional TV on podcast sites uh, and uh, 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 we called it Spokane, so we called it Spokane 
on talks online so people would know that they go online and not not going to find it on the TV dial or the radio dial per se. We ended up being both on on the audio side and on the TV side because one day I said I uh, uh, I want to put uh, cameras in the studio um, and let's capture some of this. The very first day we did that was kind of fun because it overloaded the, the laptop and it didn't go live. Uh, and so we learned a few things like it needs, needed more RAM and, and, and different cameras. But we started off with what most people have on their computer, the, the $135 high def cameras. And that's what we started off with. We soon realized because of one of our sponsors who literally came to us and said, we love what you're doing. It would be a major sponsor in town, but you got to move beyond just the basics. And so they said, not only will we sponsor again this next year, but we'll double the investment and help you get more professional equipment. We bought two cameras. That's what we could afford. We ended up going to three cameras. We ended up uh, doing a better studio. We ended up adding microphones that were much better. Um, uh, I think we improved what we did. Um, the challenges were out there in terms of others doing some of the same kinds of things. And then there was kind of the downfall of two, 2022 because so much depended on me as the seller, uh, as the salesperson. Um, and, and with all that I had on my plate with illness, and with the death and, and so forth, uh, I could not devote the time. And so this last fall, it became obvious to me that I can't do this on a day-to-day -day basis. I've got more responsibilities with my son and so forth, and uh, to sell a house, you name it. And so uh, this last fall, I stepped back Sulana, you took over as as uh, kind of the manager, and 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 uh, but our intention with the the investors that day when we had the meeting was, if Kent isn't available to sell all the time and so forth, it's got to look different, which means it's it's got to stop what it is. It may come back in some other form down the road, but it 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 can't continue to be what it is, and so. As of the end of December, Spokane Talks doesn't officially exist in a live sense. Well, that was, uh, you just gave the whole history instead of just the how did it get started there. Um, one of the things when it got started was you had to find people that wanted to tell their story. So I, I'm, I've always been interested in how did you find the, the number of, the broad range of people that you brought into the studio to tell their story? I'm trying to think of his name right now. He is the uh, column, not the columnist, but the editor um, at uh, the Journal of Business, Paul Reed. Early on when we were just doing audio, he made the comment to me, he said, I don't know how you get the people you get to come on and be guests. And I knew exactly what he meant because I might have had an audience of 15. I might have had an audience of 10, which is nothing, okay? But I knew what he meant. And what he meant was, Kent, you have been involved in the business community for 30 some years, almost 40 years. You know people, people trust you. People will say yes to you and honor your commitment to this community. And that's how I got a lot of people, because I could come to you, Sulani, and say, I'd like you to be the guest. And I, I, I'd hear an excuse, well, I'm not good in front of the camera, or whatever it might be. But I would be able to talk you into, you've got a story to tell. We've got a Miravu story to tell. You've got a story to tell what you do your, with your church, what you've done with your architectural firm, whatever it might be. And that, that, that there are others out there who would be interested. And I really feel very fortunate in so many ways that people have honored my involvement. My involvement from day one in Spokane was with the, with the Spokane Chamber of Commerce. So it's always been business related in this community. Kent, you've been uh, networking 
clearly throughout the community for, for all of your career. Um, you, you said that I was your mentor. You're my mentor because you recruited me into to do a program that was just audio, and then it turned into video, and I never would have stretched to do that. Uh, but you did that with a lot of other people as well. So who are, could you tell me the names of a couple of your favorite uh, programs that you got to play with? Well, one of the programs actually came from a, a radio that Tom MacArthur and I did called Business Talks. It was a chance to bring business people in to, to talk about what was going on. And, and it was fun uh, several times to beat the big guys in town and have announcements days before the newspaper or TV because we could get them on and have them talk in a, in a very comfortable style. Uh, and, and, and that was kind of kind of fun. We did uh, we did ho house to home with Clyde Hawsey. Uh He's doing his own thing now with the uh, Home Builders Group to talk about how to improve your home and so forth. Uh, we had done that up on Fox 28. We we launched that. I'll give give Fox 28 a lot of credit. We launched that in 1978, just as the recession hit, and so the the station. Fox 28 stayed with it, even though we didn't have all the advertisers we'd like because they felt it was good for the community, for people to learn how to do things for their own homes and, and, and so forth. Uh, we did a segment at the very beginning with, with Spokanimal Care um, to, uh, to have them come in and bring a dog or a cat each week and so forth. Um, we've, we've done a number of, of, of various programs uh, over the years, probably a total of 10 to 12 different, I mean, we had the car guy who talked about cars. Um, I, I, I'm not remembering them all, but you know what we did is we got people in the industry to come on. They weren't professional TV or radio people. They were people who understood the subject and could talk language. They could talk about why you need to keep your car up to date. They could talk about why it's important to do this with your house and that with your house. What time of year uh, do you uh, 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 fertilize your lawn and so forth on major holidays throughout the year? That's something I learned. You know, and that would get you through the year. Uh, that would be pretty close to the time to be doing it. So I learned a lot myself, and I know our viewers did. You were really building on that experience you had with training accountants and engineers to speak yeah, to people. Yeah, yeah, So yeah. there was another kind of program, one that it was totally your brainchild, and you asked me to host, and that is Meet the Candidate. Could you talk a little bit about how you came up with that idea for the community? Well, you, you know, part of the problem of broadcast, radio or TV, is to spend the time to... Uh, bring on the various candidates and as you know in the last few years some offices have had five six seven eight people running for it and to try to give them all their three minutes or five minutes be takes up a lot of a lot of time and it comes down to it takes up a lot of commercial time and that, that's how stations make their money and I felt it was important to have people come in and talk about why they're running what 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 motivates them to run for office and, and seek that office. And we invite in every single candidate. Not all come, but most do. Uh, I'm pleased to say that I've had probably more candidates on Meet the Candidate who have said no to other media in town because they felt safe with us. We asked them safe questions. Why are you running for office? We try not to get into arguments and I'm, he said, she said, that kind of thing. And um, uh, I, I think it's worked very well. It's one, been one of our most popular programs, often getting 50 to 100,000 pe people watching it every political season. It's one that I enjoyed getting to meet candidates yeah. as, as people as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. I had one person when I sent them a request this last May, I think it was, or April, uh, to the owner of the, of the, of the uh, uh, business and said, would you consider uh, being one of our sponsors for uh, Meet the Candidate? And she got back to me within about five or six minutes and said, I love that program, put me down, yes. Well, that's one that I'm hoping we can see picked up uh, I, I, I think somewhere it needs to be done, yes, yes, it, it needs to be done. 
and uh, yeah. So any other uh, final comments on the on Spokane Talks media experience before I'm going to segue you to another subject? Um, it, it's been a good experience. I will tell you that um, I've learned a lot. Uh, and I think I said this earlier in the game here. Um, I thought it was TV on, on a podcast platform. It's more than that. My original purpose was that Spokane in the Inland Northwest needs to have a forum somewhere that people can get their opinions out. And we've had liberals, we've had conservatives, we've had all kinds of people, people for, people against. And uh, I think people need a, a way to express themselves in something other than a controlled 30 second commercial or a 15 second soundbite with a with a uh, reporter or anchor person. And, and so um, uh, that was one of my purposes from the very beginning and was until the very end. Okay, so there's an idea out there that somebody in the network could, in, yeah. in your network could pick up and go with. Yeah. Okay, so one of the things that I was always fascinated with was every office that you had as Spokane Talks Media moved around to different studio locations, you had up on the wall these uh, lovely framed photos of a uh, ghost town called Bodie that I had never heard of before. Yeah. So I, I'd like you to tell the story you finally told me about why you have these Bodie pictures and, and the, the map of the town up on the wall of every office. Yeah. How did you connect with Bodie? Well, I grew up in Southern California in the Pasadena area, okay? Uh, above us in Pasadena is Mount Wilson and Big Bear and other uh, other mountain resorts. Almost all of them you can stand somewhere up there and look out and see all of Los Angeles and on a clear day which isn't often you can see the ocean. Okay, That was my experience of mountains. Uh, one year uh, at age 14 uh, my parents put me on the YMCA uh, trip to Mammoth Lakes, California in the High Sierras. I'd never seen mountains like the High Sierras. Um, again, much more impressive than in Southern California. One of the trips, um, we were there for a week, one of the trips was to a ghost town called Bodie. And it was owned by the banker. It had not become a state park at that point. And I remember specifically being told, we all have to behave ourselves because the next Y group coming in after us next week, next couple days, are going to be judged on how you behave there and take care of an old ghost town, 150 years old. And so I remember at age 14 going in there and just was awed by this old town. I had seen an old town called Knott's Berry Farm, which was an amusement park, okay? And, and, and Disneyland had a little section and so forth. This was an actual town founded in 1859 by William S. Bodie. He spells his name differently than the town does now. The, the, the town, I believe his spelling was B-O-D-E-Y. And so uh, when one of the uh, barn stables people was putting a new sign on, on, the, on the stables, they spelled it B-O-D-I-E, so it was clearly Bodie. Um, but um, uh, it, it, it went from he and one other person. He died in a snowstorm in 1859. Didn't make it back from a trip getting food and so forth. His partner who did make it back to the cabin ended up dying a year or two later. Welcome to what life was like in 1859 in, in Gold Rush com uh, country. Um, this is above Mono Lake. It's east of Yosemite for people who know basically in California. Um, I've had the pleasure, um, well, this town just took over. Years later when, I, when my wife and I had kids, we went to Disneyland, took the trip, saw my parents, saw her parents, and on the way back stopped at Mo Mammoth Lakes. And one day I said, we're going to Bodie, we're going to a ghost town. And my kids just went, ah, I don't, we don't want to go there. And, and all that. Ended up, they had their best day ever. 
the next year around Christmas time, we would plan our summer vacation. And the first question that came up the next Christmas time was, can we go to Bodie? In fact, we, we made shirts for all of us and our friends that went to Bodie with us, uh, from, that met us there from Southern California. We all had show, uh, shirts, the same shirts on and so forth. We just all fell in love with this authentic ghost town. Uh, a lot of people know about the San Francisco and the earthquake in 1906. Most of, that, most of San Francisco was built on the gold and silver prior to 1906 from Bodie. Very few people know that, okay? In fact, Bodie was so popular, the mariners who would, who would come in and bring around the horn and, and everything else, bring in prospectors, would often leave their ships there and go with the prospectors to come to Bodie and what in uh, high Sierras to go uh, because they could make more money at the, in the gold rush than they could uh, sailing ships and, and so forth. Um, but uh, quite a history. Um, most, most people don't know about the history with what Bodie did for, for San Francisco, but, but quite an impact. And so I, I can tell that when every time that this is the second time I've heard you tell that story and your eyes light up with that that 14 year old's sense of discovery. Yeah, it, 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 it was really something. I had gone, as I mentioned before, to, to local Y camps and stuff, resident camps and so forth. But to see the mountains of the High Sierras, to see an old ghost town, which by the way is only 10% of what it was originally. It had two fires. The first fire, they were smart enough to put in a pond up on the hill and a, a system, a water system to go down to put the fire out. The only problem is it was never hooked up. So when they had their fire, they weren't able to put out the fire. And then a little Bodie Bill, I think he was about six or seven, loved to play with matches and he, he kind of took care of the rest of the town. But the, in 1932, I think it was, um, in 1963, 64, it became a state park and is a state park. And that's when I met a couple of people, including a friend of mine, Brad Sturdivant, who was the uh, 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 park ranger there at Bodie. Well, that's a good way to move on to the, the legacy that you would hope to leave with Bodie. And I told you I'd, I'd make sure you got to have the last word on, and to make a pitch for supporting yeah. Bodie and a, and a deeper knowledge of, of history. Well, about 12 years ago, it might be a couple more years, but around 12 years ago, I talked to Brad and I talked to a, 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 com, a com, computer geek friend of mine who knew how to do all the computer stuff and websites and everything else. The three of us teamed up and I said, you know, my background since, since age 18 has been fundraising for, as a volunteer, as a paid consultant, been involved with nonprofits, worked for YMCA's, worked in Spokane, probably on half the nonprofits in town here and so forth. And I said, it's time to form a foundation to help preserve Bodie. Uh, because the state's not going to put up all the money. So we started the foundation. Uh, you know how those things go. Even though I lived up here and live here, uh, I became the chairman of the board. You kind of outnumbered when you can't be in the same room with everybody, you're on the phone. But um, became the first chairman. They've since added new board members. I haven't been a, 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 on the board now for about 10 years or so. Um, but but they're doing things like uh, trying to write up the building, the, the Methodist church, which is leaning. There are, there are the, the, the town is remarkably preserved. It's in arrested decay, which means they take care of the roofs, they take care of a lot of the things inside that you don't see for structurally, so they're sound. But you're talking about a 150 some year old town, okay? And it's, it takes the weather. I mean, this, this winter has been an, a, a good example of 20, 30 foot snow drifts and so forth. And, and uh, I'm bound and determined now that I'm not doing Spokane Talks, that my main, my main objective in the next few months and years, hopefully, will be 
to improve their fundraising and their outreach. And uh, I've got friends, in fact, in this room right now that are going to help me with that. And uh, I've already talked to them down in Bodie this last s September. And uh, we're going to begin to do some things in the next couple of months and literally go down and spend probably several days in Bodie doing some on-site interviews and so forth. And I know enough of the stories, but I don't know them complete. But I know people, and I've got probably every book on Bodie. You it know. sounds like a great, uh, a second I flunked retirement project for you, Ken. Well, you know, you know what it is? It, it, it's, it, number one, it pleases me. I go back to, I go back to when I was a young kid going to my grandparents' house in Hollywood, California, and sitting on the ottoman at the end of my grandfather's big cozy chair and listen to him talk about the Calvary and, and the time he was in the service and so forth, and that absolutely fan, uh, uh, was fantastic. I learned a lot. I didn't realize I was learning to love history, but it came that way. I didn't like it so much in the books, in school, and so forth, but I do now. And, and um, I, I, want, I want others, not only in California and not only in the West, but people come from all over, the, all over the world, especially Japan and other places, they come to Bodhi to look at the ghost town. And uh, I wanted it to be preserved so they can see what life was like 150 years ago. Well, That's, Kent, we're going to put we're going to put contact information for that uh, along yeah. with this video, so people can follow yeah. up on your on your request. Yes, and uh, do you. our best to preserve the Spokane Talks Media Archive as uh, capturing capturing a, a, a snapshot of Spokane in this last decade. Yeah, thank you for all you've done for the community. Thank you, Sulani.